Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery on a Saturday morning. Uh, this Saturday, it's before the big storm, so but we have a beautiful morning today. Today's class is on plums and their relatives, the pluots and the pluries. <clears throat> now, there's not that many plums that actually perform well in our location, Orange County. We're kind of a mild winter area, but we still sell them because I love plums. So it's kind of more personal. So <clears throat> the thing about plums, pluots, and pluries, and as with all stone fruit, is they do need a chill requirement. They have a chill requirement that you have to meet in order to get a good bloom and a good uh, uh, growth on the trees. And of course, if you don't get a good bloom, you don't get a much of a crop either. So these trees generally require about 300 hours or more chill hours, which for most of the country is no big deal. But for us, 300 hours is about our average. And we did have a stretch from 2013 to 20, I would say 2021, where we didn't get 300 hours of chill. So a lot of the plums just didn't produce. Now, in Orange County, especially during winter, the cold air clucks in the low spots. So if you live along the Santa Ana River or within a block or so of the Santa Ana River, if you live near one of the creeks, Aliso Creek, Tribuco Creek, San Diego Creek, the low spots collect the cold air. The cold air does settle at night and all through the morning hours the, along the riverbeds you get a lot more chill than you do if you're on a plateau or especially if you're on a on a hill. On the south side of a hill you get your least amount of chill. So we know that people along, especially Santa Ana River being the biggest river in Orange County, uh, that's the coldest area of Orange County and plums have always done well right along that riverbed. We have uh, one of our good friends who lives a block off the Santa Ana River and he gets, he's pretty reliable on the plums. But I was living on a hilltop South County Hilltop, and boy, we went for years without getting plums there. So it depends where you are. Uh, just the block can make a huge difference. Uh, generally, if you walk in the streets in the winter morning uh, and your neighborhood isn't perfectly flat, you'll notice that when you go downhill, your legs are getting colder. I mean, it can just, in a few feet, makes a lot of difference on top of that. So, um, Generally, two foot off the ground, if there's no wind blowing, two foot off the ground is a lot colder than 10 foot off the ground. So the other thing is, the, the lower you keep your trees, branch, fruiting branches, the more likely they are to pick up the chill requirement. Now chill, as far as these fruit trees is concerned, it's the actual flower buds on the trees. It's not the trunk, it's not the roots. It's the flower buds and the growth buds on the tree that need to experience that cold. And it's cold they, that helps them is somewhere between 55 degrees and 34 degrees. Um, it's interesting, it's not below freezing. I guess uh, in biology, things stop working when you're frozen. So it's, it's uh, 34 to 40 to 55, and it's not a straight line either. So a lot of computers make it a straight line, say so you get chill, well, the first program was a straight line between 34 and 45, and above 45 you get nothing, below 34 you get nothing. But in science, true science, they say it's nothing's a block like that, it's a curve. So you get a little chill all the way up to 55, and a little chill down to 34, and you get the most chill around 45. So, and nice thing about a lot of areas around here is we get a lot of temperatures below 55 in the winter, uh, especially when there's no clouds. But this next storm coming in is a very cold storm, or it'll end up being a very cold storm. And we expect to be, well, they said tomorrow is supposed to be uh, between 41 and 50, 59 is the high or something like that. So you're getting chill almost the entire day at that point. I mean, uh, with those temperatures, you'll probably get about 12 hours of chill in a 24-hour day. So we can get 100 hours of chill in a week. Right now, 
Uh, most of the homes in Orange County are sitting at 200 hours or right below 200 hours. We lost some chill last week, um, but we get uh, you get a much above 60, you start losing your chill. So there's there's a couple models they use. The original model was you don't lose them. They don't say you lose any chill, but they just record the hours between 34 and 45, and that's it. And that works pretty well because, you know, if you're between 34 and 45, um, you're getting quite a bit of chill on those hours, and you're still getting more chill than that, but not much, so they just record those. The dynamic model, which is called the Utah model, which we think is more accurate, you get chill between 34 and 55, most at 45, you lose chill when you get much above 60. And you lose a lot of chill if you get much above 70. So this winter has been, you know, I mean, we had some winters 10 years ago where January we'd hit 90 degrees. And those years we were, you know, they said we we're getting like 100 hours of chill. Now we got more than that. That was on the, the model where they just say between 34 and 45 because the fruit tree, most of the fruit trees that needed 200 hours still woke up and did fine, but if you needed 300, you weren't even close. And we spent 10 years with those kind of weather. Uh, last year, we hadn't, didn't have anything approaching 80 degrees in the winter. And this year, uh, we got to about 80, but uh, nothing much above, above 80 this winter. So this winter is, is more, I would say more normal, which what we had, you know, before 2000. So, um, so it looks like we'll have a good plum year this year. I think in t the next two weeks, the rest of February is supposed to be cool, just like this. So, uh, we should break 300 hours this year for, for most areas. And some areas, like they said, Cota, uh, the, f the field station in Cota de Caz has already reached 380 hours. Uh, Long Beach has reached about 200. Irvine, less than 200. Um, so different areas get different uh, chill rates depending on how where the field station is. So the field station in Long Beach is right along the riverbed. Uh, Cote de Caz is in a canyon. So those areas do get chill. I mean, we know in Tribucal Canyon, you know, just above Cote de Caz, uh, uh, our customers there said that their thermometers have already dropped into the 20s at night. So we know that that area, you know, the canyon areas are just, you know, it's just a few miles inland. They <laughs> get really cold in those canyons. So anyway, um, when you plant the bare root trees, we have bare roots, right? We have a few container ones left from last year, too. But the bare root trees are the easiest to handle. I mean, a bare root tree without the soil around the roots, this weighs... So it might be six pounds. Now we do usually pack wet paper around them. That gets them up to about 10 or 12 pounds. But uh, you, we, we sell them in the bag. You put the bags, leave the bag, leave the trees outside in the shade somewhere. The only time we tell you to bring them inside is if they tell you the temperature at night is going to drop well below freezing. We don't want the bag to freeze. Roots in the ground are insulated from frost. So in the Basically, in the southern United States, if you're not on a mountaintop somewhere, uh, the ground never freezes. If you're, in a, you know, if you're in Canada or Alaska or Siberia, it freezes. But here, the ground doesn't freeze, so the roots don't have to worry about that. We don't want them outside in the bag getting frost. So, if you know, we haven't had frost probably for 20 years, <laughs> a bad frost for 20 years. Um, but you never know. I mean, we never know with these weather patterns. Uh, 1990, um, December 23rd and 24th, 1990, we hit 23 degrees in the central Orange County. Two days in a row, and we had, everything was frozen. So that can happen, but uh, probably not this year with the uh, El Nino conditions. So when you plant these, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, you, you want to cover the roots, but you don't want to cover the graft, although I have done that just to see if anything would die or would happen and nothing did happen. So, but your normal range of planting would be a, covering the roots to about covering the graft. The original soil level is right about here. 
And again, I planted them this deep without any consequences. Um, we don't want to put anything in the ground. The beauty of bare root is because it's used, it gets used to any soil you put it in, no matter if it's clay or sandy or silty, even gravelly. Um, it's like they adapt to it quite well. Since they're sleeping at the moment, as they wake up, they'll adapt to what conditions you've given them. Um, no compost in the ground, planter mix compost, planter mix uh, kills the roots. The only time we usually have trouble is if someone lets their gardener plant and we've, we've had plants come back to us in mid-spring, totally dead, and you can smell them coming in the door because they're just rotting. So you knew that the gardener had filled the hole with compost, which is what people have been taught for the last 40 years to put compost in the ground because it, it, it's nutritious, but it's deadly to roots. So don't do that part of nature. All the dead stuff is on top of the ground. The ground itself is this mineral. If you melt the dirt, you get glass. So, so do that right. Uh, after you get it planted and watered once, or if the ground's wet, don't even water it. But it's nice to water it once only because we want to hold the trunk when you're watering it just in case the soil settles awkwardly because sometimes you water it and suddenly this the tree goes and once that soil is dry you just cannot get that thing straight again so you hold it after the first watering it, the soil settles and then it shouldn't move again and generally we don't stake any of the bare root trees um, these roots are, you know, they'll hold the tree straight. Straighter than a stake will. I mean, a stake is just one thing going straight down, but these guys have nice root systems that once they're in the ground, they can't. It's really difficult for them to shift. And generally, if they don't have a stake on them, they develop much stronger than that they do. A stake is like uh, putting your arm in a cast and saying, okay, get stronger. Well, you can't do it because you're not bending. So trees get stronger because the wind bends them. But now the other thing is, um, when you plant a bare root tree, that's your best chance to develop lower branching. And the lower branching you get, like on this, this is a last year's bare root tree. We cut it right here so we can get these branches to grow because it was just a stick. So if you you cut it, you usually get branches below the cut, and then it grew from here. We cut it again in summer because it was already eight foot tall by summer. And then it grew again. We cut it again. I mean, we cut this thing twice last, three times last year because uh, these bare root trees grow quickly. Even if you don't fertilize, you'll get a lot of growth. I mean, we do recommend for most homeowners that you fertilize it once and then forget about it for the rest of the year. Um, orchards, they tell the orchards don't fertilize it. Because the biggest problem in the orchard is that if the trees grow too fast, in orchards, they generally don't have as good uh, wind control. So if you're on a farm, there's usually no houses or walls around you to stop the wind. And if the tree gets too much of a canopy on top in an orchard, sometimes the wind will blow them out of the ground. So they want to avoid that the first year. Is don't fertilize them. They only grow maybe two or three feet. Whereas we don't mind it in our own backyard getting a good six, seven foot of growth on them. Now this tree is a little bit tall and skinny. And if you leave it the way it is, most of your growth will come up off these branches. So after you plant the ground, I like if there's not many branches on it. Now a lot of our bare root plants come with lots of good branching, especially our peaches, apricots are coming well branched, apples are coming well branched. But if you don't have it, this only has one branch on it, it's best to cut this where you want most of the branching to start. So when you put this in the ground, now this is going to drop about 15 inches going in the ground, so everything's going to go lower. But I like to cut a tree without branches about waist height. And then you'll get your branching coming out around two foot off the ground, two to three foot off the ground. And then your most of your fruit will then be forming somewhere in this area rather than having to climb a ladder to pick it.
Now the overall shape we want fruit trees to be is somewhat of a fan. So something like this. Uh, generally we want, you know, you want your trees to be lower than eight foot so you can reach the fruit without having to get off the ground. Uh, you don't really want a full-size plum tree. You can grow this to a full-size plum tree. It is, it is, they, you know, the rootstock doesn't really dwarf them much. But uh, I used to grow, you know, back in the 80s when I first started growing fruit trees, I grew my plum tree to full size, which is about 15 foot high and 12, 12 foot high and 15 foot, 18 foot across. And the year I got, uh, you know, I got several good crops on it. It's like 400 plums and you have two weeks to eat them. So it's like, okay, I had to give away about 95% of the fruit I grew. So now we tell people, well, you know, the realistic size for your backyard is maybe five or six foot wide and seven or eight foot high, and that'll give you about 50 to 100 plums for two in two weeks. You don't want 400 or 500 pieces of fruit in two weeks. It just doesn't, you know, you just can't eat that much. So if you keep them that size, it does require a little more pruning, but it, you know, after a few years, the tree stops trying to grow big. Uh, my last house I lived at, you know, we, most of our plum trees were about five foot wide and seven or eight foot tall. And we just kept them pruned that size. Now on the timing, during the summer months, springtime, we don't like to prune them much. You want to just let them grow, get their strength. But starting in summer, you start clipping them to keep the height under control. So during the summer months, you keep them cut somewhere below seven or eight foot. They stop growing when fall starts. And then in fall, they start developing all their flowers for next year's crop on the branches that have the most light. So you wanna do your height control during the summer because if you do it during the winter, your best flower buds are way up there and you cut it back in the winter where well, you've just lost your best crop flower buds. So we want to cut them down to height, say sometime in September. They're not programmed to grow after that. Now this year they did, which is the weirdest thing. This this last year, everything was two months behind schedule. Even Dave Wilson, they, they sent us the trees two weeks late because they said they've never seen a flush of growth on their trees in November before. And it happened last year in November. Everything was way behind schedule. Uh, we think two months behind schedule, and we think winter this year is two months, you know, close to two, at least a month behind schedule, because we just got cold two weeks ago, and um, it started raining a couple weeks ago too, and that's uh, that's at least a month behind schedule. So everything's behind schedule anyway. So in the winter time, you don't really have to cut them shorter then, but you want to make sure your branches are about a foot apart. So here you see, well, we got this branch in here that's in the wrong spot. So we want them to be a foot apart because you need the light coming in here inside the tree to develop the short fruiting branches. So this is the fruiting branch. These are all, all these short branches, they're fruiting branches, and they'll grow along these areas of here's one right here, here's one right here, here's one right here, real short fruiting branches along the larger branches of a tree. And if you don't get any light in there, they don't develop. And then the only place they can develop would be out here where there's more light, but that means your tree has to get bigger over here to do that. In order to keep it the same size, you gotta allow the light to get inside the tree. So for this tree, will most of the flowers be on the bottom half? Right now, yes, because these, these branches develop a little, well, this area of the tree is older. This area just developed last year, so they should develop these same little branches up here this coming year. Yes. So if you keep it uh, open, the side row, do you have to turn the side row? Mm -hmm. A bit, okay. if you want to keep it within. So we know that sunlight can go through uh, up to three foot of foliage. So if your tree gets much wider than five or six foot, you stop getting production in the middle. So to keep that going, yeah, you keep cutting it so it's not so wide. And yes, summer pruning.
keep the tree's dimensions there, and then in the winter you go through and thin it out. And uh, the other thing is don't let kids climb your plum tree because they're going to break off all your fruiting branches. Are those fruiting branches just good for one year? No, these, these are good for quite a while. Uh, I've read four or five years, but they can probably go longer than that. And now the thing that plums do over time is the weight of the fruit can make these branches bend outwards and get in your way. And what happens overall is most of these branches start going like this from the weight of the fruit. And they keep making new ones in the middle. So as these spread out and get lower, you can just trim them out if they're in the way. And they keep making new branches here that then kind of get pulled down by the weight of the fruit too. The fruit fruit weighs an awful lot. So these branches start doing this. So. Generally we don't thin plums. Uh, like peaches, we thin out the fruit one every eight inches on the branches. Plums, their their branches, fruiting branches are much shorter than peach branches, so we just let them cluster. And they tend the fruit quality tends to be fine. I mean, some years it's ridiculous, and you go ahead and thin out some of them. You know, if they start forming an inch apart, <clears throat> then um, you know you'll have to thin that out. You know, this is a half barrel size, 25 gallon container. I brought that in because that's a decent size to grow a plum tree for about 10, 12 years. So generally in containers, figure about 10 years is good. This, this pot is too small. So the smaller pots, on some of the hot days last summer, we were watering them twice in one day to keep that thing wet. So something larger is better. Of course, you can, you know, if you, this tree was only this big, which you could do, that pot would be big enough. Plums don't seem to be hurt too much by hot dirt. So, you know, in the summertime, the black plastic containers are at least as hot as the air is or hotter, which is too hot for most plants. Plums seem to tolerate that pretty well. Uh, apples don't like it so much. Cherries hate it. Um, but plums seem to put up with it pretty well. But you can always shade your pots, uh, shade the side or paint it white or something to keep it from overheating. Uh, the ground never gets above, say, 90, 95, but uh, containers, you know, on the, on the side of a pot where the sun hits it, if the sun does hit it, it can reach 130 or 40. The plastic <laughs> gets really hot. So you're gonna, you are going to lose some roots on that side of the pot. Yeah. What uh, nurseries do is they put smaller pots... So in the nurseries, well, there's two things they can do. Um, they can put this pot inside a larger plastic pot, and the larger plastic pot will be insulation for the smaller one inside of it. The other thing they do is they put the pots and holes in the ground. In fact, what they do in a lot of nurseries, <clears throat> and mainly to protect them from the cold, is they'll drop a big pot into the ground. They'll make a hole first, put the bigger pot in the ground, put the smaller pot inside the big pot in the ground. That's pot and pot. And most of the container nurseries across the United States do that because most of the nurseries in the United States are in areas where they would freeze to death if they're above ground level. So they drop them in pots in the ground. Yeah. They do. They leave in there all year. Oh no, this is just a nursery. That's just temporary. And most nurseries just have plants for three or four months and then they sell them, so. But if they overwinter, they'll have, they have to sink them into pots in the ground or else put them in a greenhouse, which is not really easily done. Okay, now the nice thing about plums, there's not many diseases that we work with on them because we don't get much rain in the summer here. So we really don't treat them much for disease. Now we do know that a few types of plums, and it's always been Santa Rosa plum, 
gets rust on the leaves if it get rain in the summer or the fall. We don't usually treat it. We just, it, you know, we had one good rainstorm in the fall and one good rainstorm in the summer this last year, which is unusual. And we did get sea rust on some of the plum leaves. But at that time of year, late summer or fall, it's no longer critical that that you have to fight diseases. Uh, fertilizer wise in the ground it's better to go organic so we we generally carry a couple of organic products although uh, mostly down to earth nowadays um, we do have a few dock earth around in pots we generally start them with osmocote then switch to an organic later on because in pots uh, organics take a lot longer to start working in the ground they, they work pretty fast just because the things that break down the uh, organic fertilizers are in the ground, but they're not in our pots yet. So, unless you put some dirt from the ground in your pot too. Um, now this last year was a really bad mildew year, so we actually treated our plum trees and it's the relatives for mildew. So the best mildew control we know of is combining this mineral oil with baking soda. Um, so, you, so let's put down uh, mildew control. Don't anticipate it this year, but you never know. But last year, I mean, the, we, there was a bad year, 9, 2015, but last year's mildew was really nasty. It was on everything. So for, and it's powdery mildew. There are different types of mildew. We don't see them here because we're not human enough. If you're on the East Coast, you see something called downy mildew, which is a lot more serious, but not you don't usually see it here. So powdery mildew in uh, one gallon of water. We've been doing four tablespoons of this oil and one tablespoon of baking soda. And that has worked really well. That'll also kill a lot of bugs, aphids, spider mites, white fly. Um, now, some of the other stone fruit get caterpillars and boars on them. Plums, it's so minor, we've never treated them for that. Um, they do can get aphids real bad. The old does a decent job, but the main thing is to keep the ants out of your garden because the ants put aphids in your trees. Uh, I remember when I was back in the 80s, all the leaves at the top of my plum tree were all rolled up and sticky. And looked up there, there was, uh, just thousands of aphids on the new growth. And we knew it was because the ants were going up the trunk. So in those days, because it's what we did, I just sprayed the trunk with uh, contact poison so the ants can get up there. And then one week later, the new growth was fine again and it was covered with ladybugs. So the ants shoo away the ladybugs without the ants up there, the ladybugs cleaned up that tree in one week. That was late spring when it was warm. Uh, early spring, uh, the ladybugs aren't out yet. But this is our best uh, ant control nowadays. Now they made the label black. I think it makes, maybe makes people think it works better than their white label. <laughs> but Amdro is, about the best the ant control that we can sell you. There are better ant controls out there. What do you think of stuff like this? Well, we've used that. Uh, that works for that tree, but this will kill the ants in your entire neighborhood if you do a good job. So, if you don't want ants in your house or any, you know, ants in general cause trouble on all your garden plants. They're not really good guys. I mean, the harvester ants are supposedly seed collectors and bug collectors so they don't do any problems but the argentine ants which are those little black ants or dark brown if you want to call them that get into our houses and cause havoc they farm sucking bugs and even the big carpenter ants which are native here we didn't think they were going to do any problem until we saw them farming sucking bugs we're gonna so we said okay we want to get rid of the ants and harvest ants can sting, and so can those little red fire ants. So if you want to get the ants out of your garden, this has done a good job for us.
It's a bait that they eat um, that has a real low amount of um, uh, poison that kills them in three days. So they can feed the entire neighborhood's colonies and you can wipe out the super colony neighborhood with one good treatment. Yes. Um, well, you see an ant trail, you just put, just plop it down where the ants are walking. Sometimes it's on top of a wall. It doesn't have to be near the tree, but just wherever the ants are walking. Sometimes the edge of the sidewalk is where they're walking. Yeah. It's cornmeal. Yeah. If you put it on the fruit, you don't want to put it on your fruits or your vegetables. You don't have to put it on your fruits or vegetables because the ants find this. It's more attractive to them than, than, than your fruits or vegetables. You can put them in little trays and set it around if you want to keep it clean. Um, so one of our customers called up the company want to know how much of this it would take to, for his dog to eat to kill it. And they told him that there's, it would, his size dog, which is around 30 pounds, it would take two pounds of this to have enough poison to kill his dog. This is uh, one and a half pounds, and this will treat uh, um, oh, about a uh, quarter of an acre. Goes a long ways. I mean, we, when this product first came out, we used it in our yard twice in one year, and nobody in our neighborhood saw ants for 10 years after that. <laughs> Apparently, we killed off the super colony of that neighborhood. It was kind of amazing. We didn't, no one saw ants for a long time. So we're pretty amazed. It doesn't always work that well. It depends on, uh, on how many colonies are around you. Okay, so control the ants, uh, the mildew, not too many other things you have to control. Um, so just, now the varieties to know which varieties do best. So on the plums, there's just no super reliable plum. Like peaches, nectarines, we have a few varieties that never fail to produce a good crop. Uh, apples never fail to produce a good crop. Plums, we just don't have one. There's just not a super low chill plum that always produces. Yes. What about the nectar plum that you wanted It didn't work for us. Some of those numbers that they give you are off. So we sold methylene plums for ten years, never got any you know, we got one or two fruit on the trees. We don't a lot of the chill hours that are listed are not correct. A lot of them are just not correct. They list them generally see most nurseries are in the Central Valley that make up the numbers. And they put the numbers down in the order that the plants wake up, but waking up early doesn't necessarily mean the chill was lower. Uh, so, hard to say. I mean, methylene plum is grown in some valleys in Hawaii, I believe. But still, the valleys in Hawaii can get pretty cold, the uh, high mountain valleys, so. Um, but we grew it in our yard, and. Never had more than one or two fruit on them. So we kind of gave up on that one. Um, the lowest chill plum that we we think is the lowest chill is Inca, but we can't get it. Another nursery that went out of business five years ago had that. Dave Wilson sold a few of them that's in their catalog, but there's nothing on their, in their current catalog for us, and there's nothing on their availability list. So we'll be looking. I'll ask them again and see if they'll grow it. But Inca plum seemed to be about 250 hours. Uh, well, maybe 280. It wasn't, it still wakes up later than uh, all the low chill peaches and nectarines, but it woke up pretty much every year for us, but never a huge crop. Uh, Beauty is listed at around 250 to 300. We think it's closer to 300. Um, now, Santa Rosa was always listed at 200 to 400 hours, 
but it never did produce well for us. I mean, I grew Santa Rosa for 20 years, got one good crop. My dad grew it for 10 years, got one good crop. So Dave Wilson finally this year on their latest information sheet that we hang up for bare root, productive chill range 400 to 1,000 hours. So they totally changed it because we know that the 200 hours was totally wrong. They see the problem is is that it's always produced well on the riverbeds of Orange County. So they thought, boy, it must not be needing much chill here, but it's it's the riverbeds. You look at Sunset Magazine's um, chart, and they'll tell you Zone 22, the plums do well, and that's the river beds of Orange County. The low spots between the rivers and the river beds themselves is zone 22. They don't do well in zone 23, which are all the hills and plateaus of Orange County. And that is so when you say it doesn't flower, it doesn't flower. Doesn't flower. And so for 10 years uh, in our nursery, the plums wouldn't leaf out in spring. They would stay looking like this all spring long, all July, and in August, they'd put out a few, you know, they'd finally give up and put out a few leaves, maybe an inch of growth, and that's it. That's all they did those years. For 10 years in a row, that's all we got on a lot of the plums and some of the, you know, a lot of the stone fruit that didn't get their chill, that's what they would do. They would wake up and survive by putting out a few leaves on each branch in August. Yeah, Santa Rosa is the top rated plum taste wise because because it does have both sweet and tart. You know, the skin is tart, the flesh is sweet, it's tart near the pit. It's got that going on, so it's still the top rated um, plum taste wise. So Burgundy, we believe, is slightly more than 300. And then uh, we have Satsuma, which is slightly less than 300. Uh, there's Weeping Santa Rosa. So Santa Rosa, we think, is more than 400, just like the majority of plums. Because I've grown a lot of plums. I've grown, over the years, Golden Nectar, Mariposa, uh, Elephant Heart, um, Besides, but besides all these, um, oh, a few more, I can't remember the names. And I grew them in the 80s. So the early 80s were hot years, nothing worked. But starting about 86 to 19, in the, to the early 90s, those were our coldest winters ever recorded, <laughs> apparently. Because I was getting good crops on all those plums. I thought, boy, we can grow in everything here. I, mean, I just started gardening, and suddenly, five years into it, all my plums, all my pears, everything was producing great fruit. And then in the 90s, it gradually we got warmer and warmer winters all the way up to about 2014, 15. And then, since then, we've been going the opposite direction. We've been getting cooler winters again since about 2015. Um, similar to the early 80s when we were throwing plum trees away because they wouldn't wake up by June. We thought if they didn't wake up by June, they were never going to wake up, so we just tossed them. Um, but anyway, so... Well, I mean, Santa Rosa has always won the taste test, but of the ones that we promote, Beauty, Burgundy, Satsuma, um, I like Burgundy. Beauty is supposed to be better than Burgundy, but Beauty for us ripens early June. And they're not at their best quality because we got June gloom. So most years, Beauty, which ripens late May to about mid-June, uh, doesn't have much flavor. Burgundy ripens late June through July, so it's usually at its best quality. 
burgundy doesn't have much tartness. That's the only problem with it is a lot of people say it's like eating a big cherry. Um, but, uh, you know, I, would, I was in heaven back in the 80s. Uh, so in the 80s, my now burgundy plum is now being considered a universal pollinator. Because when I had it back in the 80s, it would bloom for over two months. So what would happen is that in the mid 80s, we were getting weather like, like this year. Warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. So different parts of the tree reached their chill requirement at different times. So what my burgundy plum would do, it would start blooming at the bottom in February. It would finish blooming at the top of the tree in April. The fruit was ripening from late June to early September. I mean, that was perfect. I, I, was, I was picking about eight plums every day from June to September. Now, it hasn't really done that much in the last 10 years because we haven't had the chill, uh, adequate chill. But I was amazed. I, I said, this tree's in bloom for three months and it fruits for three months. And that's why, and it just still, they, they say it's the best pollinator because it's got the longest bloom period of any plum that they know of. Because most plum trees are in bloom for two weeks. And this thing usually, I would say, a couple months, month and a half, two months. The burgundy, this is not, this is not burgundy. But burgundy plums would do that. So it's become our best pollinator. Satsuma is supposed to need, this is Satsuma, it's supposed to need a pollinator. It's supposed to be self-unfertile. But I have quite a few customers that only have Satsuma plums in the yard, and they said they get a good crop. So I don't worry about it so much anymore. Um, so Satsuma is pretty reliable, but to me, the, I don't like the flavor of it. I'm, you know, I'm supposed to. It's got a Japanese name on it. <laughs> and Japanese people like it. it. It's not from Japan. Luther Burbank developed this variety. Satsuma in Japanese means sweet. But uh, Luther Burbank, who is famous for the Burbank potatoes that I have on the shelf there, he made his fortune back in the 1800s because he saved, well, he fixed the, Ir the Irish potato problem by developing a potato that would handle the rains better. Of course, it only happened one year or a few year period there, but. Uh, He's the one, he made his fortune creating the Burbank potatoes, bought up 100 acres of land in Santa Rosa or uh, Northern California and then started, started uh, breeding plum trees. So he bred Santa Rosa, he bred uh, Satsuma, he bred Beauty and Inca. Um, he did quite a few of the plums that we still sell. Yes. Yeah, I heard um, uh, Luca Burbank, he got the from um, Yeah, he claimed that he, uh, you know, he was uh, kind of a maverick among scientists because he, they said, they, they, they complained that he didn't take notes of what he was doing. And he claimed he had crossbred apricots and plums way back in the 1800s and no one believed him. Until in the 80s, they checked the genetics of some of the stuff and said, yeah, he must have crossed apricots and plums back in the 1800s, uh, which... You know, it wasn't really done before Zeiger got to it in the 70s. So um, it's interesting what he did. He did a lot of work on plums. Um, so anyway. Um, the Weeping Santa Rosa plum. may or may not have a lower chill requirement than Santa Rosa. It just may be because of the shape of the tree, all the branches hang to the ground, that they get more chill because they're lower to the ground. Weeping Santa Rosa is the sport of Santa Rosa that, unless you stake it up, the branches just go downwards. So, I do have a friend who lives along Aliso Creek. He gets Weeping Santa Rosa fruit on his tree every year. 
he hasn't missed a year, but he's a long, he is within 50 foot altitude of that creek bed, and that is a cold creek bed. Uh, actually, it's not a Liso. Yeah, it is a Liso Creek. So. Okay, so Weeping Santa Rosa does well near rivers. It may not have a lower chill than Santa Rosa, but it acts like it does. Now, back in the old days, we don't have access to more. I grew a tree called Autumn Rosa. That fruited on some really warm winters. Dave Wilson doesn't grow this. Now, Autumn Rosa was interesting because when I grew it, it made a hordes of perfectly beautiful plums that ripened in late August. They never got soft. <laughs> I mean, these things stayed rock hard. I, I guess commercially that was perfect. They didn't turn into water balloons ever, but they're crispy plums. That was just really weird. But I don't know anyone who grows it at this point, so but it did produce well in my area, even during some warmer winters. So there's only a few plums, you know, there's 100 plum varieties out there. Uh, we tried growing Italian plums or prunes for 10 years, never got more than one or two fruit off the trees and our customers said the same thing. So we've given up on those, they need 800 hours of chill. So uh, France and Italy, where they grow them, is, is like Northern California or Oregon, where they do get 800 hours easily. Yes. Uh, have you ever experienced or grown new varieties of uh, Rosa, Catalina, and Bignano? Catalina never got much off it at all. I haven't grown new Bignano or the other one, or La Rosa. But, uh, you know, we did get really good crops off of Mariposa, Golden Nectar. I mean, almost any plum would have produced here last year because we had over 800 hours of chill last year. Um, although the problem we had is it rained during the bloom period. So they would have bloomed, but they wouldn't have fruited well. This plum seemed to need a dry bloom period. I mean, you know, it's perfect year when the plums are white because this is just a big ball of white flowers and it's 80 degrees out. If you see that condition, pure, you know, big ball of white flowers, 80 degrees, you got a good crop. Last year, we didn't see any heat in the spring at all. This rain throughout the spring. Okay, so that's the plums. So the Zeiger family developed pluots uh, and we've been selling pluots for over 10 years now, now well, over 20 years, since the 90s. Pluots were introduced in the early 90s, and they are roughly three-quarter plum and one-quarter apricot. So pluot, so what, what was first on the market were plum cots, which are half and half. We tried those, never did anything, and even the ones that made a few fruit didn't taste that good. So plum cots were a failure. So they back crossed the plum cots with plums and got pluots, which are more plum, less apricot. And those have been especially a commercial success. The, the markets love them and the farmers love them because compared to plums that have, true plums have about a three day picking window. If you don't hit, if you don't pick in that, in those three days, if you pick it too early, it never sweetens. If you pick it too late, they're already on the ground and they blow up because they're water balloons at that point. So they only have a three-day picking window. Pluots have a month picking window. They just don't deteriorate on the tree. Some have a two-month picking window. And uh, in the store, same thing. You leave them on the store counter, they're good for a long time. Not like a plum where the plum is, turns into water bloom really quickly. Uh, if you pick it at the right time, it becomes a water bloom real fast. But a pluot will stay firm and nice for a long time. So the pluots have been a very good commercial success. The top rated fruit we can grow according to the Dave Wilson taste test, Flavor King pluot. I grew this at my last house I lived at 
And boy, when it's fruiting, uh, good fruiting year, you're in heaven. <laughs> I mean, it's like the perfect plum. So you don't taste any apricot, it's just the perfect plum. It's a deep red, it's not purple, like the burgundy plum is more purple, real dark color. The Flavor King Kluot's a really dark red. Inside and out, it's really dark red. You can pick it three weeks before it's ripe, it'll ripen and taste sweet. I mean, I remember I went on a, a road trip a month before you're supposed to pick them, but I said, I'm gonna miss this. So I just picked a bunch of them that were just starting to turn red and took it with me on my road trip. And three, two or three weeks later, they were good. Uh, it says 300 to 1100. Um, so the let's let's go by chill. Uh, lowest chill uh, pluot that we sell is Dapple Supreme. And this one, which is not quite as good as the Flavor King, is less than 300 hours. And really, Dapple Supreme really hasn't missed a year for us at all, so it may be lower than 300 hours, much lower than 300 hours. But it does ripen June into early July. And it will hang, so you can just leave it on the tree till it's sweeter. Because when you pick it in mid-June, it's not quite as good as it could be because it's, there's not much sun at that time. But, but if you leave it on the tree, it, it does get quite good. Um, then you have Flavor King. Seems to be right around 300 hours. And you have Flavor Grenade. which might sneak in there right between Dapple Supreme and Flavor King. It might be a little bit less than 300 hours also. But this ripens August into September. This ripens September into October. So this is the last of the stone fruits that, that uh, you can eat, harvest. No chance on that one. It's like a thousand hours or chill or eight hundred hours. We had we get some trees now and then. I mean Dave Olson when they send us trees, sometimes there's a we look in the the bundle of flavor kings and there's a flavor supreme there. Someone got the package mixed up, so we kept around the nursery for a few years but never got anything on them. Um, now it is true now and then you try something just to try it even if the hours aren't right from Dave Wilson they still does well here that's how we got our cherry lapines which is one of our main cherries we sell uh, originally it said 700 hours but it produced its second year and never failed to produce on any year and so you know flavor finale you might have to try it again now that it's no longer zero hours of chill like it was 10 years ago we're actually getting some chill it may fruit here. I mean, we had it during the real hot year, so there was no chance. But now that the winters are getting cooler again, who knows, it might work. But the problem is when we order stuff, we have to order in bundles. We can't order just one tree. Um, now, just so you know, you can order just one tree from a lot of mail order companies and give them a try. That's how I found a Lapine's Cherry is I ordered from a nursery, Stark Brothers Nursery in Missouri, which we found out later, gets all the trees from Dave Wilson Nursery. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, Flavor Nade, a little less. Um, so Flavor King, the chill isn't super high on it, but it won't fruit unless the burgundy plum flowers. Burgundy, burgundy plum has, I had them close to each other, and if the burgundy plum bloomed that year, my pluots loaded up. But if burgundy plum didn't bloom, I didn't get a good crop, and burgundy seems to be slightly higher than flavor king. So burgundy plum may be 320, maybe it might be as high as 350. 
Um, Flavor King seems to be right around 300 hours of chill. Flavor Aid a little bit less. It seems to always bloom a little before Flavor King and Dapples Cream blooms before Flavor Grenade. But they're all reasonable for us. We sell Emerald Drop, but have not seen any fruit on it. We sell Splash, haven't seen much fruit on that. Uh, people who live in the canyons and along the riverbeds can grow these, but most of us can't grow these two. Now Splash is interesting, so these three are really good. Uh, this is more yellow than, than purple. Um, it does have a nice sweet tart flavor. It is, I mean, it's a really weird fruit in that it feels like a rock on the tree. It never softens on the tree. The birds never seem to do anything with it. Once you pick it and take a bite, it's not rock hard, but it feels really hard in your hand for some reason. Um, so these three are our main three. Splash tastes like a cherry. But no one's got much fruit off it in most areas of Orange County. So we're not going to promote it that much. Emerald Drop is a nice golden variety that's supposed to be have the lowest chill of the golden fruit. Like we grew Flavor Queen for 20 years, got one fruit off it. It was wonderful fruit. Uh, a nice yellow uh, pluot, but it only made one fruit. <laughs> So we gave up on that one. Emerald Drop has got supposed to be lower chill than Flavor Queen, but uh, I don't know if it's low enough for us. So, But anyway, these three are the main pluots that we sell. Uh, Flavor Rosa produced really well, but it ripens in May. It was, it was terrible fruit. So Flavor Rosa, 300 chill hours or less. Um, ripens real early. If you're in Riverside or if you're in uh, Fresno, it may, the quality may turn out good around here, not, not very good. We grew Geo Pride too and it really didn't like the flavor of that one either. So, so these three, we do like it. No, you have to have pollinators for all these. Now if you have these three, they may pollinate each other. But we always recommend putting a burgundy plum in with them because that is the best pollinator for any plum or pluot or anything else that needs a, a, a plum as a pollinator. Yeah, would we also uh, like to uh, pollinate the berries as well? Or did you also just put in the plum? No, uh, supposedly the pluaries can be pollinated by any pluot if they bloom at the same time. That's the big issue is the bloom time. So we'll talk about the pluries next. So the way Dave Wilson makes these really weird things, so though they don't do it in the lab, I mean they do part of it in the lab, but they don't, you know, they just take the uh, pollen from an apricot and put it in a plum. Uh, it'll, it'll actually make an embryo in the flower. But there's no way that, that, that it can make a fruit. So the whole thing eventually fails. So what the Zeiger family does is they do what is called embryo rescue. So once they cross an apricot and a plum, they'll take the embryo out of the flower and put it in a petri dish and grow it there. Because the fruit dies because it's, it's an improper pollination of the fruit. The, Part of the flower that makes the fruit is different than the part that makes the embryo of the seed. Uh, so it's kind of weird how that works. So they have to save the embryo that's in there by putting it in a petri dish and growing it there, and then they grow the tree and grow it that way. So it's an embryo rescue, they said, but they don't do any weird genetics in the lab where they put a fly gene into a plum flower. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, the pluaries are plum cherry hybrids. And these are now one of the better plum relatives that we recommend because they've been very reliable. So this is Sweet Treat Pluary, which is, to us, it tastes like a plum, but it's got the texture of a cherry. They're about the size of apricots. 
So we've got two that have been very good for us. There's uh, Sweet Treat. And Candy Heart. Sweet Treat we got back in 2014. And it was the first tree in our store to bloom that year. We're going, this thing's got really low chill. But it didn't make any fruit because we didn't have a pollinator for it. Nothing bloomed uh, when it bloomed. It was just too early. So we think the chill on, on Sweet Treats may be 250. This thing says, <clears throat> it doesn't say on here. I believe uh, their official is uh, 300 hours or less or 400 hours. I think it might be 400 hours or less. But it blooms early. I mean, it blooms along with Tropic Snow Peach and those other really early low chill things. And Candy Heart blooms before Sweet Treat. When we got Candy Heart in three years ago, it's bloomed before Sweet Treat. So we think this is less than 250. And these two will pollinate each other. Some years, they'll bloom the same time as Bernie Plum. But most years, they're blooming a month before it. Yes. Right. So they don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, it takes them a while to change their literature. That's one of the things. Because we'll tell them for years that the chill, no, that's not the right chill. And they'll finally get it, that it's not the right chill. I mean, I've been complaining to Dave Olson for 20 years that Santa Rosa doesn't produce for us. So they finally, this year, they fixed their sign. <laughs> but Sweet Tree and Candy Heart, they're like, they bloom really early and heavily. Um, and even during, this is like four years ago, I think we had about 280 hours of chill that year. They both bloomed really early, and we had two trees that overwintered here in the nursery, a candy heart and a, and a sweet tree, and they both set heavy crops in a 15-gallon bucket. So we know that their chill is way less than 300. It's probably less than 250. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the chill on it could be really, really low. So um, yeah, but that pear seems to be the one. Candy heart tastes like a cherry texture of a plum, and then sweet treats the opposite. Tastes like a plum texture of a cherry. So, but both really good. Both ripen in July, which is unusual. Early bloom, mid-season harvest. Usually the early bloomers are ripen early, but both these ripen in July, and they both have a good month, month and a half hang time. So there's not much wrong with these two. Now, we brought in a few flavor punch. We're sold out at the moment. This one we think is more than 300 hours. We got fruit last year, but we didn't get fruit uh, three or four years ago when fruit when we didn't have the chill for it. Flare Punch, we don't know much about yet. It's only third year out. But Candy Heart's been around. Uh, Sweet Treat's been on for 10. Candy Heart for about five or six years now. Uh, Haven't tried that one yet. That one's listed pretty high, but you know we might have to try it <laughs> just to see what the chill really is. So we got plenty of these two. I mean, these, these two, if you like plums, these are great. Again, they're about, about that big. Uh, sweet treat sometimes comes a little bit um, egg-shaped. Doesn't always look like this. Seems to be elongated some years. Candy heart is shaped like a little plum, about apricot size. I mean, our customer loves it so much. When Kenny Hart first came out, our customer just loved the fruit so much, he brought me a quarter of the piece of his fruit because it's all he can, he can sacrifice. <laughs> he says, you got to eat this. It's really good. So, 
Oak, any questions on any of these? I mean, so I've basically given up on forms because I've been in the house for 10 years. I've tried a number of different forms and plots and other things that I just can't get enough. Right. I'm now figuring out that uh, it's probably too warm than I can just all the time. Because, I mean, there's years where I've been weeped out and the winter would come. Like, okay, let's go. And then spring would come and just uh, flower. Right, right. So, what's my <clears throat> best, like, what's my best walk to get some? The pluries. Really? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't seen any, any plum or plot lower chill than the two pluries. So, and I put those, uh, both there, we're pretty sure that we can get. Yeah, the just plant them this far apart. Right. Yeah, these have been the best, so. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right.